Thank you. I'm a microbiologist, and I study ecological interactions among microorganisms within their communities and within the environment. Today I'm going to talk to you about methane, its importance on the earth, and some amazing relationships that bacteria transforming methane have. Perhaps you know methane as the most important component of natural gas. Because methane is odorless, when it's used in residential applications, we add a chemical to allow you to detect its smell so that it does not build up, potentially causing an explosion. Methane has a simple chemical formula, CH4. In fact, it's the smallest, but it's the most abundant hydrocarbon. Firstly, we use methane as a fuel. About 28 trillion cubic feet of methane are consumed each year in the US, with about a third going to industrial use, a third going to electricity production, and a smaller fraction being used for residential and commercial heating. Natural gas as a fuel is only surpassed in the US by petroleum. But as a fuel, natural gas composes about 26% of our energy use. Unfortunately, methane is also a greenhouse gas with about 10 times the potency of carbon dioxide. What that means is that every molecule of methane in the atmosphere reflects back about 10 times as much heat as a molecule of carbon dioxide in the same location. In that respect, methane is the second most important greenhouse gas next to carbon dioxide. Methane can be formed through high temperature biogeochemical processes or geochemical processes in deep rock, or it can be formed by bacteria that live in sediments and soils. It gets into the atmosphere in a variety of ways. About a third of it is released from natural gas and petroleum deposits. But of the remaining sources of methane, about 50% of them are human related. And by far, the vast majority of that methane is produced by bacteria. Aside from the petroleum related sources, the primary source of methane, or a major source of methane, is the enteric fermentation. This is methane that's produced in digestion, during digestion, by cows, sheep, goats, and yaks. Yaks are important as well. <laughs> These animals all have a large digestive organ where they break down grasses and other plant materials to a variety of products, including methane. The methane is released by eructation, that is, belching. The total methane released from this source is directly related to the number of grazing animals out there. Perhaps there's a solution. One of them is for you to eat less meat. Another is fairly simple. We could trap the methane <laughs> before... We can trap the methane before it's released to the atmosphere, and this has actually been implemented. <laughs> so some of you are asking to yourselves, hopefully, <laughs> whether, <laughs> whether humans produce methane, whether we have methane-producing bacteria in our GI tract. And that's where I'm pointing down here. Um, and the answer is that some of us do. But even in those people, by far the most important source the most important gas that's produced um, and released <laughs> by uh, these processes um, is, not, is not methane, but it's hydrogen and carbon dioxide. OK. <laughs> um, there, there are a couple of other human-related uh, human sources of methane that are very important. Um, one of them is this management of animal wastes, management of waste from cows, pigs, and chickens. When these feces are contained, the uh, naturally occurring bacteria break down partially degraded feeds, uh, producing methane and carbon dioxide. And landfills are also another source of methane. All of the trash that you 
produce ends up in a big hole in the ground that we cover with soil and call, the la call a landfill. Think about what's in your trash. Food, paper, building materials. These can, also, these can all be converted to methane and carbon dioxide by soil bacteria. Finally, this other category is extremely important. This includes places, locations where plant growth and subsequent burial or storage occur. I'm talking about wetlands, peat bogs, and tundra soils. This is not the most important source of methane at the moment, but it's receiving a huge amount of attention by scientists. And this is because there's a lot of carbon, a lot of plant-derived carbon stored in these locations. As global warming occurs, soils will warm, dramatically increasing rates of methane formation, and thawing permafrost soils, making carbon available for conversion to methane. Okay, I think it's time to talk about who makes methane, and by that I mean the bacteria involved. I actually have a number of favorite bacteria. <laughs> um, but these methane-producing bacteria are at the top of my list. Bacteria, right? You can line up about 10,000 of these microorganisms across the face of a dime. These methane-producing bacteria are special, and their story goes back a long time. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, and during the first 2.5 billion years of the Earth's history, the Earth was a rough place to live. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere, and so respiration as we know it using oxygen did not occur. When I discuss respiration, I'm referring to a cellular process of breaking down a food in the presence of an oxidant and producing energy which is used for cell growth or other processes, like standing up here and giving a talk, for example. <laughs> the atmosphere on the early Earth contained primarily carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And so when bacteria were looking for a chemical to respire, carbon dioxide was the most abundant compound. So as life and respiration evolved on the early Earth, respiration of carbon dioxide to methane became a dominant process. These methane-producing bacteria developed a very complex mechanism, a very complex biochemical mechanism for producing methane. But even now, these bacteria use a very limited range of foods. They're illustrated here. These compounds, these chemicals that they use as foods were abundant on the early Earth, but are much less abundant now. As bacteria and plants and animals have evolved over the billions of years of Earth's history to produce more and more complex chemicals, these bacteria have not increased their repertoire of nutrients. They've taken the strategy of teaming up with an unrelated organism. The process is called syntrophy, which literally means feeding together. The strategy involves one bacterium breaking down a complex chemical and feeding its products to a methane-producing bacterium that use those to grow. So, how does this work? These bacteria must seek out a partner, and they do this by recognizing chemicals that are located on the outside of the cells of the other organism, of the other bacterium, and swimming towards it. These bacterium must be close together to grow syntrophically. There are two strategies. In one case, the close proximity is required for these bacteria to most efficiently exchange nutrients. Alternatively, these bacteria can just exchange electrons. They do this using what we call electrically conductive nanowires. These are filaments made up of proteins and metals, and these cells are connected by an electrically conductive network. 
that allows these cells to carry out the complete conversion of complex organic chemicals to carbon dioxide and methane. Now, these bacteria evolved in, a, in an environment that was devoid of oxygen. And as a result, these bacteria cannot tolerate oxygen. So methane production only occurs in environments in which oxygen is depleted. This, in, this includes most of the locations that I've talked about already, rumen, wetlands, landfills, tundra soils, etc. There's another part of this story, at least from an ecological perspective. You may be wondering whether all the methane that's produced actually makes it to the atmosphere. After all, that methane typically must pass through soils, must pass upwards typically through soils and sediments that could potentially benefit from the large amount of energy that's available. And there is a large amount of energy, provided that there's a suitable oxidant available, like oxygen. In ocean sediments and bottom waters, that oxidant is sulfate or nitrate. But in soils and wetlands, oxygen is used. Here is an example of an amazing system where methane is partially or fully oxidized before it makes it to the atmosphere. A number of years ago, I worked on a peat bog. Here's an example of a peat bog in Latvia. The one I worked on was called Thoreau's Bog, and the guy with the mustache is one of my colleagues. Um, this is in northern Massachusetts. These peat bogs are abundant. They're located in northern areas, northern part of the US, Canada, northern Europe. They were formed as glaciers moved south, carving divots in the ancient rock that's present in these locations. As these holes filled up with water, this sphagnum moss began to grow. And sphagnum modifies its environment, decreasing the pH, releasing acids, ensuring its survival in the system. Because of the low pH of the water and the relative lack of oxygen, the previous year's growth of this sphagnum moss decays quite slowly. And as a result, you end up with literally thousands of years of moss, thousands of years of dead plant material growing underneath the live plant. As this material decays, methane is released. Methane is formed and then released and actually gets trapped up in the decaying plant material, serving to allow this entire plant and dead plant, a dead plant complex to float up. And it actually floats like a raft, so you can walk out on it. And these people are actually walking out on this layer of, um, this layer of sphagnum and other materials that's perhaps a meter or two thick, and there's water underneath. So as the methane is produced underneath, it actually moves upwards. And some of it ends up being oxidized to carbon dioxide. Some of it makes it up to the atmosphere. The same process occurs in wetlands all around the world. For example, uh, um, in the OU duck pond. <laughs> the upper part of the OU duck pond is an awesome wetland. There's methane produced, and then this methane passes through plants that have the potential to oxidize it. Perhaps an interesting part of this story is that the bacteria that convert the methane to carbon dioxide are not located on the outside of the plant as we would have expected. They're actually located within the plant cells. These bacteria are present in a symbiotic relationship with this plant in which the plant provides shelter for these bacteria and the bacteria either provide nutrients or energy to the plant. Okay, I've spoken about a number of complex relationships that bacteria transforming methane are involved in. Now that we're beginning to understand the mechanisms for these relationships, we can begin to develop technologies that take advantage of this information. Perhaps the most obvious potential application is in the energy industry. Methane can be oxidized, 
And in nature, this process involves the removal of electrons. A number of scientists have developed what we call microbial batteries or microbial fuel cells that take advantage of microorganisms and their mechanisms and their reactions to produce energy from wastewaters, to produce electricity from wastewaters. We can think about a similar process developing a microbial battery to use methane to generate electricity. This power could be used on site or it could be pumped into the electrical grid. Conversely, electricity has the potential to be used in a microbial system to produce methane directly. This could be used when surplus power is available, and we will have surplus power as we expand our solar power production. I recently obtained some funding from the National Science Foundation to study novel methane oxidizing bacteria. And some colleagues on this project are interested in value-added products from methane. Perhaps the most obvious example, the most obvious chemical is methanol. Methanol is a liquid fuel that can be much e more easily transported and stored than methane. It also has a number of industrial uses. My colleagues are interested in biodegradable polymers. These are chemicals that are produced by bacteria that can be used to substitute for plastics and do not last forever when they're released into the environment. These bacteria also have the potential to produce proteins for other medical or biotechnological uses. Finally, as we improve our understanding of methane transformation, we can get a better idea, a clearer picture of the factors that limit methane release to the atmosphere. Environmental scientists are always looking for better ways to predict the flux of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere so that they can determine what sort of changes in human activities are needed to slow down climate change. Thank you for your attention.